So we've seen a number of examples that show that these paradoxes are not only of academic interest. But what about mathematics and computing? Paradoxes have prompted mathematical breakthroughs. The apparent paradox that these squares, the numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, and so on, are a proper subset of the positive integers 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, because the integers contain all the squares and many, many more numbers, and therefore the integers must be the bigger set. And yet the two sets are also in one-to-one -one correspondence by matching each integer with its square, and so they have the same number of elements. This has puzzled mathematicians from Galileo's time until Cantor resolved the paradox with his theory of infinite sets. But it was at the beginning of the 20th century that a plethora of paradoxes emerged, which led to rather sensational developments in the logic underlying pure mathematics. At the end of the 19th century, mathematicians like Gottlob Frege on the left were trying to put mathematics on a solid foundation through set theory. The idea was that the concept of a set, simply a collection of objects, was so simple that we could be sure no contradiction could arise from it. But the English logician Bertrand Russell showed that even the Arcadia of set theory was not free of paradox. Russell's paradox starts with the observation that some sets are members of themselves. For example, the set of all sets is itself a set, so it is a member of itself. Whereas the set of all teapots is not a teapot, so it's not a member of itself. So being a member of itself is a property of some sets, but not others. This means that we can consider the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. Let's call it S. Is this set S a member of itself? If it is, then since it contains itself, it's not a member of the set of all sets that don't contain itself, which means that S is not a member of itself. But if S is not a member of itself, then there must be a member of the set of all sets that don't contain themselves, so it is a member of itself. And we have a loop very similar to that of the lie in Raymond Smolian's interview. Russell's paradox was a disaster for Frege, who had to insert a note into his two-volume book that was then in press, noting that Russell's example had refuted the whole work, although some people now feel that was an overreaction. It entered popular as well as mathematical culture, often recast as the barber paradox. In a certain village, the barber shaves all and only those who do not shave themselves. So who shaves the barber? If he shaves himself, then by the proposition, he is not shaved by the barber, so he doesn't shave himself. If he doesn't shave himself, then the condition states that he is shaved by the barber, so he does shave himself. Well, for me, the barber paradox is rather different from the set theory one. The barber story simply proves that there cannot be a village in which that situation arises. If I said that, in a certain village, 2 plus 2 equals 5, I would be lying. There is no such village. And the same is true of the village in which the barber paradox is supposedly set. There cannot be such a village. On the other hand, Russell's set theory paradox um, is much more of a genuine problem in the context of naive set theory. And other paradoxes were examined at around the same time. A linguistic analogue of Russell's paradox is due to Grelling and Nelson. Some adjectives, like short or polysyllabic, describe themselves. Short is a short word, and polysyllabic has many syllables. Others, like long and monosyllabic, do not describe themselves. Long is not a long word, and monosyllabic has more than one syllable. So let's call the former those adjectives that do describe themselves, autologous. And let's call the others, those that don't describe themselves, heterologous. Now, is the adjective heterologous itself heterologous? If so, then it doesn't describe itself. And if it doesn't describe itself, then by definition it's heterologous, 
and so it doesn't describe itself. On the other hand, if it's not heterologous, then that means it doesn't describe itself, so it is heterologous.